Praise the Lord, everybody. I want to thank the Lord for letting me be here tonight. Thank you for his many blessings on me. Uh, I'm just so grateful for everything he's done for me, for keeping me. Uh, these last few months have not always been the easiest, but whenever I need him, God has been right there for me. You know, school's out, so it was a little bit of a struggle to come up with a story from school to go along with my sermon tonight, which, uh, but I can't break the pattern because that just would mess with my head too much. So, uh, you know, one thing I've observed is I've been teaching for about six and a half years now, uh, and one thing I've observed is that students are never patient. Students never want to just stop and sit and listen. They always want to get to the end first. They want the end result. They want the reward at the end of the day. They want to just know everything and not have to actually put in any work. And if they would just wait, it, they would understand it so much better. I get so frustrated as a teacher where I'm talking, I'm explaining, and social studies is tough. You know, no, you know most of you probably slept through your history classes. Uh, it's not easy stuff, and it can be boring, but it's important to really understand the details. And I need them to understand the way that these things build and cause and affect, and it's a chain of events. It's a web stretching back from today into the past. And that takes time to kind of put into play and get them to understand. And they always want to just jump to the end. Or, the, or I'll have the kid who raises his hand and says, well, what about this? Well, if you would have let me finish talking, we would get there. Okay, what about this? We get there, and next thing you know, they're all confused. And they get very upset with me, especially in government and econ class, because they'll ask me questions. Because they've heard little bits of stuff their whole life. And they'll ask me questions, and they'll ask me, well, what about this? And I'll say, we'll talk about that later. And they're always like, you're lying. You're, 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 just, you're just trying to say that it gets to be quiet. I'm like, no, I promise you. It's in my curriculum. Now, Later might be three or four weeks, but we'll talk about that later. What I'm trying to get them to understand is that they have to wait for the timing of it or else it'll all fall apart. If they really want to see it come, you know, see this, this whole thing I've been leading them towards come to fruition, they have to wait. They have to be patient. You know, and I was reminded too, uh, of course, I thought of this after I told Pastor Jimmy that I would preach tonight is uh, tomorrow morning I'm giving the commencement speech at graduation for my seniors. And it's uh, kind of bittersweet, kind of emotional for me, but it's, it's, you know, it's a culmination. I've invested five years of my life into these kids, and now I get to see them graduate, and now I get to, I was chosen by them to do this for them. And it's, you know, I had to wait. I had to wait these past five years to see them become these, you know, the young men and women that are about to go out and who knows what's going to happen to them next. And I was reminded of that, that I had to wait. I had to put in the time. I knew if we just jumped ahead, what, what would we miss in the meantime? If you turn in your Bibles, please, to Lamentations chapter 3, verse 21. Lamentations 3 and 21 says, This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fall, fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. If everybody would pray that God would uh, bless his word tonight.
I'm going to reread 25 and 26. It says, The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. That's my thought, is to wait on the Lord. What does it mean to wait? Might seem a simple question, but I looked it up in the dictionary. And a few, there's a few definitions here that I think are kind of applicable. To wait means to stay in place in expectation of. To act as a server for. We'll come back to that one later. To remain stationary in readiness or expectation. To look forward expectantly. Or to be ready and available. To wait. We're... we're told many times in the Bible to wait upon the Lord. Amen. Turn with me to Psalm chapter, or, uh, yeah, Psalm chapter 130, verses 5 and 6. Psalm 130, verses 5 and 6. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. What are we waiting on? What are we waiting on? Go to Psalm chapter 62. Psalm 62, verse uh, 1 through 5. Psalm 62, verse 1 through 5. Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will ye imagine mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain, all of you. As a bowing wall shall you be, and as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, and, but they curse inwardly. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. What are we waiting for? When the Bible is telling us to wait on the Lord, what are we waiting for? And the answer to that question is not one thing. We're waiting on salvation. We're waiting on his coming. We're waiting on him to move in our life. We're waiting on this thing to happen or this thing to happen, this thing to change. You know, waiting on this next step in whatever it is that you're doing. You're always waiting on something. And here's the thing. Waiting is about the easiest thing you can do physically. Because all it requires is for you to sit there and do nothing. Okay? Now, that being said, waiting is one of the hardest things to do mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Because we're impatient. We're all, you know, we, we, you know, we grow up, we become adults, we do these things, and we like to think that we're, we're better than we were when we were kids. No, most of us are more impatient now than we ever were as a child. Okay. I know children who can sit down for 45 minutes and listen to a teacher, even if begrudgingly they do it. And yet most of us in this room, 20 minutes in, we're like, is this guy done yet? We're not very patient people. And not only are we impatient, we, we sometimes can get entitled. We, this, this thing we're waiting on, it, it, we should have it. It should be ours. I shouldn't have to wait for it. I should have it now. I desire it now. Why can't I just have it now? And once again, we like to think that that's the children, but the adults are so much worse. Because a child will forget. A child will forget for a time. Now, they'll remind you tomorrow, but they'll forget for a time. They'll get distracted with joy and happiness and the fellowship of their friends. 
Whereas you as an adult, you're going to fester on that every minute of every day until you, you get it. It's going to eat at the back of your mind. This is the thing I want. The thing I desire, I want it now. But we have to wait. But why do we have to wait? Why do we have to wait? God could do it right now. God has all the power in the world. God could give every single person in this room the desire of their heart right now. He has all the power. It'd be easy for him. But that's not his plan. That's not his will. He has a desire for us. He has a plan for us. He has a plan for everything. And we're just supposed to fit into his plan. The blessings we get along the way are just that, blessings. We're called to present our bodies a living sacrifice. We're called to do his will. And so when you need or want something in your life and the Lord tells you, wait, you have to wait. And not only is waiting just sort of like a, like a rule, like you should wait, but it's actually a sign that, he, that we are following him and listening to him. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. This is very familiar scriptures here. Uh, Wait a minute, that's the wrong chapter. (laughs) I'm not reading that one, Jimmy. Not reading that one. Let's go to... uh, where, how did I get that mixed up? Uh-huh. No, I'm not reading that one. Um, where am I supposed to be then? I'll find it somewhere. <laughs> no, I don't want Jimmy to read it. Uh, we'll find it here. So, uh, you know what? I said Ephesians, and I meant Galatians. That's what happened. That's what happened. Yeah, thank you, sister. Galatians 5.22. That's a lot better. Well, for tonight at least. Galatians 5.22, which is what I had written down, by the way. Uh, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. It's the fruits of the Spirit. And now that we're back on track here with the waiting thing, one of the fruits of the Spirit is long-suffering. It's patience. It's the ability to wait. And we, like, we, talk, we talk about these fruits of the Spirit, and we usually think about them in how we treat other people. I'm patient with the person who's talking to me, who I really wish they wouldn't, but I'm patient because that's what I'm supposed to do. But these don't just apply between me and this person I'm talking to. They apply to me and God. I have to be patient in the Lord's plan for me. And not just out of some goodness of my heart, but because like he's not going to do it any other way. Me being, me being impatient does not change God's plans. And if you go to uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. First Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 uh, through 4 here. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity... I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind Charity envieth not. 
Charity vaunteth not itself and is not puffed up. Charity, love, the greatest thing we can do, we have to have is love. We do all the works that we think we're supposed to be doing and we don't have love with it, they're worthless. It says, I can give everything I have to the poor, give my body to be burned, but without the love of Jesus Christ in my life, it's worthless. And that love that I'm supposed to have suffereth long. That love is long-suffering. That love is patient. That love calls me to wait. So we must wait. Wait on the Lord. What happens if we don't? Usually, there are consequences. And sometimes the consequences are just a slap on the wrist. Sometimes the consequences are a broken heart. But sometimes the consequences will affect every other person on the planet for the rest of time until God comes back. And if you think I'm being hyperbolic, you all know the story of Abraham, don't you? Abraham and Sarah were promised. They were waiting for a promise, which honestly is kind of tougher. If I'm waiting for what I want, uh, you, know, you know, maybe God doesn't want that. But if God says, I have this plan for you, and then makes you wait for it. Now, you're going to start going, well, does he really have this plan for me? And what happened in the case of Abraham and Sarah? As we all know, they didn't wait. Abraham has another son, or his first son, Ishmael, not the son of promise, not the son that God promised him. And to this day, we, in 2023, are facing the consequences of that decision. People around the world facing the consequences of that decision. The descendants of Ishmael warring against the descendants of Abraham. Some, at this point, 4,000 years later. There are consequences. Anyone ever heard the story of King Saul? King Saul was not a patient man. They were going to fight uh, at the battle of the city of uh, Gilgal, I believe. And Samuel said he would come and sacrifice to, unto the Lord to, to make sure that the battle would be, would be won. To make sure that it was God's will. And seven days or so passed and Samuel didn't show. So what does King Saul do? King Saul does the sacrifice. That's not how it's supposed to work. Now, we don't, have, we don't need to get into all the details of the old Bible, but that King Saul, the king of Israel, is not the one who is allowed to, get, to give the sacrifice. And couple that with King Saul's other bits of pride, couple that with his disobedience in dealing with the Amalekites and King Agag, and God sends Samuel to anoint a new king. And the moment that he anoints David, the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord left Saul. That's a consequence. A consequence for not waiting on the timing of the Lord. But, but not every time is that we, you know, we focus on the what happens if we don't do it, right? But what happens if we do? What happens if we wait the way we're supposed to? Even if it's hard. What about Joseph in the prison? What do you wait, three years, five years in the prison cell and, uh, after the whole situation with Potiphar's wife? Before the Pharaoh pulled him out of the, there? And he, what happened to Joseph? Second only to Pharaoh. Okay? Second in the land of Egypt, able to provide sustenance and a home for his brothers when they came knocking. What if Joseph had lost the faith in the prison? What if he refused to honor his God when he went before Pharaoh? Joseph waited. And then there's waiting that we do that we don't want to do or that maybe few thought would actually happen at the time. But the whole world waited for three days. 
after Jesus was laid in the tomb. And for three days, the disciples, who had already denied him and fled in fear, they had to spend three more days waiting to see if the promises he made them were true. And they were. On the third day, he rose again. On the third day, he fulfilled all of his promises. So sometimes we wait and everything goes great. And sometimes we wait and the answer is still no. Let me tell you one of the many great stories of King David. A not so great story, actually. King David uh, took the wife of another man, had the man killed. And uh, the prophet Nathan came to him and said, hey, let me tell you a little story. There's a man who has many sheep, and there's a man who's got one sheep. And the man who has many sheep took the one sheep from the other man. And David was furious. David was ready to go. He was like, kill this man. And Nathan, like Brother Terry always likes to say, Nathan turns to David and says, it was you. It was you. And so what punishment befalls David? David's son falls very sick. For seven days, David waits on the Lord. For seven days, David is in the ashes. His clothes rent. Mour you know, mourning and praying and begging God to, to save his son. And at the end of seven days, his son dies. What does David do in that moment? What David does in that moment is incredibly difficult. What David does in that moment is why we still look to David as an example for how we should be. Because in that moment, he immediately got up, went and praised the Lord and, and, and fed. And, you know, he went and prayed. The first thing he did after hearing that his son had died, that the Lord had not spared his son because of this act he had committed, the very first thing he did was went and praised the Lord. Do I have the faith to do that? Do I have the faith, one, to face the consequences of my action, but two, on such a scale and level as King David? We have to wait on the Lord. That's not a choice. It's not, not, not a choice, but it's also not just something, you know, we, are, we have to do it. We're called to do it. We're told to do it. We're told to be in his will, not our will. But if we really think about it, get ourselves out of the way, get our pride out of the way, get our deep desperateness and desires out of the way, we want to wait on the Lord because his blessings are greater. What he has planned is greater. At the end of the day, we all should have that faith of David who when even the answer was no, and he waited for nothing, he immediately praised the Lord. Because at the end of the day, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for that's more important than all of our desires, all these little things in our lives? What are we waiting for at the end of the day that's greater than all other things? We're waiting for Christ to return. We're waiting for us to go home, to be with him in heaven. The last hope we have is the greatest hope we have. The last thing we're waiting for is the greatest thing we're waiting for. And yet, so often, it's the thing that stirs us the least. It's the thing we think about the least. It's the thing that bothers us the least. We're too busy concerned with the other things we're waiting for. When we should be thinking of the final wait, the final thing we are waiting for is to live eternally in heaven with God. And it's hard to remember, but even if we never get the things of this world that we desire in this life, we will get the things our hearts desire in the next life. It isn't easy. Not, not at all. But I think back to a song I heard that said, and this is a tough one, guys. It makes me think of my mom. It says, what God doesn't heal now, 
he'll heal then. What he doesn't fix in your life now, he'll fix then. So we need to wait upon the Lord. We need to wait and do, be in his will and not in our own will. Not in our own pridefulness. Not in our own what I want. But wait in what he has planned. And if you never get the desires that you, of your heart in this world, in the next life with Jesus, you won't matter. Because you'll be with the Lord and Savior forever. He'll take those desires and pains and insecurities away from you. What he doesn't heal now, he'll heal then. If you would stand and then come back to the music. So whatever it is that you're waiting on, whatever it is that you're desiring, whatever it is that you need or want in your life, whatever it is that you're waiting on, Come wait on it in service and praise to our Lord at the altar. If you need to be baptized, come repent. If you've been baptized and need to accept the gift of the Holy Ghost, come pray. If you need a healing touch or peace or joy in your life, come pray at this altar. Come let the, let the elders of the church anoint you with oil and pray with you. And if you are Holy Ghost filled and your life's going pretty okay this week, then you need to be up here and praying with those who are seeking and hurting and desiring. And if you're not doing that, then you need to be praying that God's will is done in this church, in your life, in all of our lives, and that we see the gifts of God, the spiritual gifts and other things manifest in this church. You should be praying for the edification of the church if you're not praying for the edification of your brother or the edification of yourself. So I ask you, church, Come pray. Come pray and seek what you've been waiting on.